Most of us have probably been sunburned at some point in our lives. After all, we do live in Australia. And most of us probably know that sunburn is bad. Apart from hurting like hell for a few days, it has been linked to skin cancers like melanoma. Scientists today know how UV damage can cause cancer. When our DNA is exposed to UV radiation, two pyrimidine nucleotides can fuse together to form a dimer. Luckily, our cells can fix this damage with no error the vast majority of the time. But how exactly do our cells do that? To answer this, we first have to ask the question, can bacteria get sunburnt? Okay. So technically speaking, bacteria can't get sunburned. They don't have an epithelial lining like us humans. But UV radiation can still mutagenize them, and scientists have known this since the early 20th century. Back during World War II, this mutagenic property of UV was utilized by researchers who were attempting to make mutant bacteria which could produce antibiotics. On this team was a young researcher by the name of Albert Kellner. During his experiments, Kellner noticed something odd. The lethality of UV was very unpredictable even under very similar conditions. Kellner became determined to solve this problem, distracting him from his official duty so much that his supervisor eventually decided to fire him. Nonetheless, through painstaking troubleshooting, he managed to determine that the lab's lighting could cause some irradiated bacteria to be revived. Now that Kellner knew that light could somehow reactivate bacteria, he could design appropriate experiments. Using a UV lamp, he exposed a vial of E. coli with a known cell count to UV light for about an hour. He then split this irradiated sample into two. He kept one as a control, and to the other, he shone it under a white light for about an hour. After incubating these samples for about one to two days, Kellner found that only around five in every one million control bacteria survived the UV radiation. On the other hand, around one in 10 light-treated bacteria survived. He called this phenomenon photoreactivation. Next, Kellner wanted to find out if photoreactivation would affect the mutation rate. After repeating the methods used previously, he sprayed both a control agar plate and a light-treated plate with T1 bacteriophage to measure the frequency of resistance mutations. Unfortunately, no bacteria on the control plate survived, meaning he could not calculate a mutation rate. Luckily, however, some of Kellner's colleagues had estimated the mutation rate for UV-exposed E. coli. Using their data, he was able to conclude that the light-treated colonies had an almost 500-fold lower mutation rate than the control. Unfortunately, Kellner was extremely limited in the conclusions he could draw from his findings. After all, scientists only found out that DNA encoded genetic material a few years earlier, and it wouldn't be until 1953 that Watson and Crick published the structure of DNA. Nonetheless, the phenomenon of photoreactivation was now known and published, and it would only be a few years until a team of researchers at John Hopkins University showed that photoreactivation was likely caused by enzymes. This team found that extracellular transforming DNA from Haemophilus influenzae, which had been irradiated with UV, could be reactivated by mixing it with E. coli cell lysate and exposing this mixture to light. It would take a further 12 years until the enzyme was finally purified and given the name we call it today, photolyase. So, how does photolyase work? Well, as I mentioned earlier, when a DNA strand is exposed to UV radiation, two adjacent pyrimidine nucleotides can covalently bind together, forming a dimer. Luckily, photolyase can reverse this dimer. When one of these dimers form, photolyase binds to the DNA. On the photolyase is a molecule called flavin azanine dinucleotide, FAD for short which allows photolyase to perform redox reactions. You might remember from chemistry that these reactions involve the transfer of electrons. The photolyase absorbs a photon with blue light wavelength, and this causes the FAD to donate an electron to the pyrimidine dimer, destabilizing the dimer and causing it to form monomers again. This electron is then transferred back to the FAD molecule. So what's so important about this process? Well, for one thing, if these dimers go unrepaired, this can lead to mutations, as Albert Kellner observed back in 1949. The reason why is because during DNA replication, pyrimidine dimers will block DNA polymerase, leading to sections of single-stranded DNA. If enough of these single-stranded sections accumulate, this will trigger an SOS response in the cell, which will repair the DNA, but also cause mutations. That's why photolysis is so important. 
as it can repair DNA before an SOS response is triggered. Unfortunately, even though photolysis is present in all three domains of life, mammals appear not to produce it. However, there is increasing research into sunscreens which contain photolysis, which have yielded some positive results. So even though our cells are very different from E. coli, and the fact that bacteria can't get sunburnt, investigation into DNA repair in bacteria is opening pathways for treating skin cancers in humans.